Hello and welcome to Engage to Change the first four years. It's lovely to see so many of you attending today. Thank you for taking the time. My name is Angela Kenvin and I work for Learning Disability Wales as the project manager for Engage to Change. Many of you will already be familiar with the project. If you are, please bear with me for a few minutes while I give a quick overview before we move on to hear about the evaluation findings of the first four years of the project and prior to COVID-19. Engage to Change is a Pan Wales employment project funded by the National Lottery Community Fund in partnership with the Welsh Government. We aim to support young people aged 16 to 25 years who are neat, that is not in employment, education or training, or who are at risk of becoming neat and who have a learning difficulty, learning disability or autism. Led by Learning Disability Wales, the project is delivered by a partnership of organisations, including Cardiff University's National Centre for Mental Health, Goriad and Elite Supported Employment Agencies. Engage to Change works in collaboration with All Wales People First, DFM Project Search, FE Colleges, local authorities, health boards and businesses across Wales. Engage to Change started in, in, in 2016 and will finish at the end of November this year. The project has continued to operate throughout the pandemic and an event will be held later this year that will include feedback on the final two and a half years. So what do we actually do? I'm not going to go into this into great detail because I think most of you here are already very familiar with the project, but just as a quick reminder. Um, so we take an individualised approach. Engage to Change works closely with the young person, their parents, carers and employers to overcome barriers to employment, develop skills, provide unpaid work experience, paid supported employment, volunteering opportunities and access to supported internships, traineeships and apprenticeships. We aim to demonstrate to employers the valuable contribution that these young people can make to the workplace and to influence recruitment practices to make them more accessible and to make the workforce more diverse. Engage to Change partners set out to influence practice and policy in areas such as disability and youth employment, work-based learning and further education. As such, we've been working with the Welsh Government and other key organisations across Wales. As a partnership, we also respond to relevant UK government, Welsh Government and DWP consultations. As a collective, we have many years of experience in the fields of learning disability, education and supported employment. However, through proactive ongoing evaluation of the project, we set out to evidence that job coach support and supported employment work, with the hope that after engaged change is finished, the support would become core funded and made available to those who need it. The focus of this event isn't on how we've influenced policy, but with the Welsh Government Employability and Skills Plan being launched recently, I want to mention a quite significant achievement for the project. Towards the end of 2019, I had a meeting with the then newly appointed Head of Disabled People's Employment in Welsh Government. I talked about Engaged to Change, Supported Employment and mentioned the idea of a national job coach service funded by Welsh Government. In 2020, Engaged to Change published a proposal for such a programme, authored by Dr Stephen Bayer, who you'll hear from later this morning. Numerous meetings and communications by Engaged to Change partners with key people in Welsh Government have taken place over the last two years and supported traineeship and supported apprenticeship pilots have been delivered. Engaged to Change partners are delighted to see that the new Welsh Government Employability and Skills Plan states that in future Welsh Government will be taking forward activity to improve access to and outcomes on our employability programmes for people with significant learning disabilities by providing specialist intensive job coach support. Job coach support will be available through the new Jobs Growth Wales Plus programme and the new Shared Apprenticeship programme, which is due to be launched in the next few months. On behalf of Engage to Change, I'd like to thank Welsh Government colleagues, in particular from Disabled People's Employment, Employment Policy and Further Education and Apprenticeships for working with us and taking the project's ideas forward. Engage to Change introduced supported internships to Wales. There were none, and now there are several programmes with more being developed. The new FE, Independent Living Skills Curriculum, includes Pathway 4 supported internships, 
and we're working with Collegae Cymru and FE Colleges who are developing guidance and quality standards for colleges to use. However, we're not stopping there. Engage to Change partners continue to challenge and work with Welsh Government, DWP and other organisations to ensure that people of all ages who have a disability or autism can access the support they need to gain and sustain employment. Last year, Engage to Change published our proposal on the role of the NHS and public sector. We would like large employers such as health boards and local authorities to lead the way in becoming inclusive employers and commit to providing jobs for people with a learning disability or autism. The DWP have recently launched their local supported employment initiative. And although it seems there will only be one or possibly two allocations for Wales, we're encouraging and supporting local authorities to apply. This morning's session will include a mixture of feedback from the evaluation report and engage to change participants telling us about their journey with the project. The evaluation report is available in English, Welsh and easy reading both languages. The link to access the reports will be shared in the chat box and circulated after this event. So enough from me. Now we're going to hear about the more important parts of the event. So I'm going to hand you over to Engage to Change Lead Ambassador Geraint Jones-Griffiths. Thank you, Angela, for the warm introduction. Um, good morning, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Angela rightly said, my name is Gannon John Scriffiths. I'm 25 years of age. I try to keep that quiet now these days, but let's be honest. Um, best part about me, I'm, I am autistic. And as Angela also mentioned, I am the, the lead ambassador for the Engage to Change project. My role as lead ambassador is to promote the project to other organisations who may refer young people for employment support and to inspire other young people who have a learning difficulty, learning disability, and or with autism. I work alongside our project partners. Some of the work I have been doing is attending and presenting at events to talk to the public about the project and to help persuade employers on why they should give jobs to these young people. I host a monthly fun hour on Zoom for Engage to Change participants. I write a monthly blog for the project's website, and more recently, I have started doing my top tips for employment for our social media. For this, I'm working alongside our comms officer, Sophie Williams. Recently, COVID restrictions have started to ease. Therefore, I've been able to get out and meet the project's participants. These are including the North and South Wales interns face-to-face -face in person. This is to inspire other young people. I often tell my story that I was a project participant and I now have two paid sustained jobs, which I thoroughly enjoy. I'm now able to travel independently across Wales and I am also financially independent. I also work with the evaluation team at the National Centre for Mental Health at Cardiff University to co-produce our research and the results. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the results from the latest project report, looking at the impact of the project on young people we work with. The Engage Change project has helped the young people with their confidence, boosting and self-esteem, giving them both physical and financial independence. The project has also given some young people a positive change to their mental health and a new quality of life. Here are a few powerful quotes from some of the young people themselves. One young person told us that one thing is that I am employed. So if people ask, I can say yes. I'm more confident in myself, starting a new life, and I'm more independent in some things. I still need transport from my parents, which is still a little embarrassing to say, but I have become more independent in the job doing stuff, and I don't mean just in work, but socially as well. The Engage Change project has helped uh, by finding people a job and by helping them with the paperwork needed. Another young person told us, the biggest thing is helping me getting the job. I wouldn't have the job if it wasn't for them. The second thing has been helping with the paperwork in the job. One more quote from a young person who was looking for more new qualifications, and this is what he said. They supported me with some of the work tasks. I had enough support in the workplace. They supported me with the work for the NVQ achievement. They helped me interacting with everybody else, working on my confidence. After 14 weeks, I asked for more hours. I had an operation and I had to be off for 12 weeks and they supported me making sure I was okay. 
Payment also spoke to us, and when Payment told us that he has got in the position where he is now, when you're into paid employment, without getting on a proper interview, which is good, because he has shown how good he is, and they got to know him as well. From another parent perspective, um, one parent told us that they asked questions on the job my son wanted to do. They narrowed it down because my son does not know what he wants to do. They helped with building a CV. They were looking for the job when they found it. They were amazing. They took him to the workplace and they backed off when my son was ready. They were meeting him at the job and stepped back, leaving him more independent. In the first year of the Engage Change project, we have worked with 700 and sorry, in the first four years of, of the Engage Change project, we have worked with 771 young people. Out of these 362 had paid work placements. A paid work placement is a placement which lasts six months or more and is paid by the Engage Change project with the idea that the employer then takes over paying the wage. As well as this, 396 young people have had unpaid work placements. 194 young people have found paid jobs. 164 of these were able to keep their jobs for over three months. During this period, Engage Change provided internships for 116 young people working with DFN Project Search and supported internship programs. These supported internships helped 41 young people get paid jobs. 29 of these were able to keep the job for over three months. So what do we need to do to keep supporting young people who are autistic or have learning disabilities into work? First thing is we know that we need accessible recruitment using an easy read application forms or working interviews. We also know that job coaching support is fundamental and we need to support young people to travel independently. And, but, um, and also we hope that we need to give young people more opportunities for work experiences so that they can try different jobs before they know which ones suit them best. We also need to change how we use our qualifications to see if young people are suitable for a job. And finally, we need better disability awareness training and support for employers to work with our young people. And finally, before I introduce our next speaker, the employment rate for young people with learning disabilities in Wales is really significantly low at only 5.1%. The evaluation of the project has found that we have really helped get more young people into work. And I would like to thank you for listening to me this morning. Now I'm gonna hang my gob for once. I know it's quite difficult for me, but um, for further for our next speaker, um, he's a real inspiration. I'm now going to introduce to you one of our project participants, uh, which is Thomas Oakes. Um, Tom is a young man who has taken part in Engage to Change as a participant, and he's here this morning to share with you his experiences of the project. Jochen Powell. <clears throat> this is my uh, journey with Engage to Change. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas Oakes. I am 25 years old and I live in Aberystwyth, Ceredigion. My favourite things to do are drawing pictures, performing arts, taking photos, going to the cinema, writing reviews, cooking food and exercising. Over the years since I left school, I have volunteered in charity shops and had the opportunity to work in a hospital as a learning disability project worker at Northampton General Hospital. I also had work experience in Marks and Spencer's Aberystwyth with the Princess Trust in the summer of 2017. I also attended Colleague Keredigian between September 2016 to June 2018, where I have studied a level one in vocational studies and did a catering course. During my time at college, I was volunteering at the Tour Cafe, working in the kitchen and helping in the community shop. After college, I was keen to find paid work. I visited the Aberystwyth Job Centre, where who were very helpful, and they told me about the Engage to Change project. And I thought it support, and I thought it would support me to help me find work. They gave me the contact details for Engage to Change. My mum contacted, contacted the team to find out more information than we applied. 
My journey with Engage to Change began when Beth Bethan, um, an employment officer from Engage to Change, came to visit me in my flat with my mother back in June of 2018 to talk about the project and the support that it, that it offered. We told her about my previous job at the hospital and she supported me to apply to work at Long Heist Hospital in the kitchen. I was successful in getting the job and I started working in the hospital kitchen in November of 2018. This was paid work, which made me realize I was earning money, which was a great feeling of being valued. Bethan visited me every week to see how I was doing. She was very reassuring to make sure that I felt relaxed in a very busy environment. The staff in the kitchen helped me to learn different roles in my work, including health and safety, hygiene, and serving the staff and patients meals. Working in the kitchen was my favorite part of the job, especially in a hospital like Long Guys, but it was very busy and stressful at times. Bethan was a massive support during my time working in the hospital. She helped me to keep calm, and to cope with, um, with any multitasking situation. After six months of working in the hospital, I decided it was time for a new challenge. Bethan supported me to look for other jobs and she support me to, and she'd support me to help to, to sorry. <clears throat> and she helped me to apply for a job in Ye or South Weatherspoons in Aberystwyth. After a successful interview at Weatherspoons, I was immediately offered a job in the kitchen as a pot washer and food prep. I started my new job in August of 2019 in Weatherspoons. The staff were really kind and supportive to me. Within my new role, I did lots of new tasks, such as preparing food, cleaning pots, refreshing washers, and taking the bins out. I also did Weatherspoon's online training courses to help me understand what new health and safety rules are and what tasks were to be completed. I worked for four days a week from nine till three. <clears throat> Bethan supported me in my new job at Weatherspoon's every week, but soon I started to feel more confident and had gotten used to the work by myself because of this, Bethan was able to reduce her support. The Weatherspoons team now let me work independently and I now feel happy to cope in a very busy environment and enjoy being part of the team. Unfortunately, in March of 2020, due to the pandemic, I was placed on furlough. During lockdowns, I missed the motivations and focus that work gave me, but I used the time to focus on myself and my well-being. When lockdown, when lockdown rules were lifted in the summer of 2020, I was able, able to return to work. When I went back to work, things were very different. We had to wear masks, regularly sanitize our hands and social distance in our own sections of the kitchen. It was strange to get used to the new rules at first, but I felt it was very important to follow the rules to keep myself and others safe. During the pandemic, Bethan continued to support and visit me when possible, checking in to see how I was doing. I have now been employed by Weatherspoons for nearly two and a half years, and I, and I am still really enjoying my work. I love the environment and working with the team in the kitchen. I know that I can still contact Bethan if I need any support. <clears throat> I think job coaching is very helpful. It is a great way for people who previously haven't had work experience to have the opportunity to help them understand their role in work better. Having a job coach means that there is always someone there to support you and to help you if needed. It was useful to have the support at work outside of friends and family. Gaining employment through Engage to Change has made it possible to look after myself independently and financially, such as living in my own flat, sharing with my sister, and looking after my own well being. It has made me more confident and improve on my social skills. 
it has also made a massive change to my to my family's life such as how such as now having my own money to to help save and pay my own way sharing bills helps my sister and me to run the flat and my family are very proud to see are very proud of me and it has made them so happy to see how settled and comfortable confident i have become in life i really enjoy my job and i would like to rem to remain working in spoons but if it would be possible i would be happy to learn new skills and increase my hours I believe as a person with ASD, the Engage to Change program has made a massive change to my life. I think people with any disability should still be given the chance to gain the support that I have had as a step to feel more confident in life and have the access to fit in with the world of work as an equal. Dior Convo, thank you, Tom. Um, Tom will be joining us later on for our question and answer panel later, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have this morning. Before I introduce the next speaker, um, we have a great honour that we have Heaven David on um, one of our attendees this morning. Um, Heaven David is the Senate member for Cafeti, so welcome Heaven David, um, thank you for joining us this morning. Okay, next uh, up we have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Stephen Bayer um, from the National Centre for Mental Health at Cardiff University. And Steve will be presenting to you the findings of the report. So over to you, Steve Dioch. Thanks very much, Gary. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I think Simon is about to get our presentation up. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak about this research. Um, the report takes us uh, up to the end of the first year, uh, sorry, the fourth year of the project. And that's just before the pandemic hit, um, which is clearly relevant. Um, we're working on year five data at the moment, and we will be following up the current um, crop of um, project search and supporting internship graduates uh, later on this year but it's it's significant i think this is where we got up to before the pandemic hit um i'd also like to thank um, my research team elisa vinya andrea meek and our administrator jacob Meehan, who've actually done all the work next slide please uh, first of all i'd like to remind you of what the model is the delivery model within um, engage the change and it's a supported employment model um, it's a very individualised model, and that's its strength, I think, as you'll come to see when you look at the range of people that we're dealing with. So it starts with spending time understanding um, people's job interests, what they're good at, and the work types and environments that they need. Um, it can use job placements and tryouts to specifically aid um, the vocational decision making, but not just any work experience for the sake of it. It's about understanding what this person needs in terms of support and what their their target is for a job um, it involves finding and negotiating a job that meets the person's detailed talents and needs not just any available job so in effect it's finding jobs for people not trying to find a range of jobs and then fit people in, in into it that way um, and that's key to actually matching uh, individually what people need um, it's also about informing and supporting employers, um, you know, helping them to do things, as Garrett mentioned, uh, making interviews more accessible and to help them to work to induct and support their, their employees. On this project, and that's why we put it in italics, we did offer paid placements and uh, what are called employer development grants that could um, actually cover wages up to six months, but was usually offered in a tapering way so that at the end of a placement, the employer, um, if they were going to employ, was paying most of the wages at that point. Um, crucially, it involves teaching people the job in the workplace using a set of techniques that go under the heading of supported instruction. So it's not just 
place somebody and pray they're going to do it. The job coach is there to actually work to make sure that that person fits in in terms of doing the task and socially. And also it involves planning well with people and families uh, to help them to manage their welfare benefits and their uh, all that's entailed in, in um, a transition into work, whether they're in Cardiff or rural powers. Um, and on the right, sorry, um, just to go back, on the right there are the job coaches, which in the project are also called employment officers, that are clearly crucial to the whole process. Thank you, Simon. Now, in terms of participation, um, Gerrit told you that we had 771 referrals. That's in um, comparison to a target of 666 um, that we reprofiled in 2021. So we're already at the end of year four um, uh, over the target of referrals. On the map on the left, you can see you know, the, the, the relative proportions in different, um, in different parts of Wales. And that's broadly proportional to, um, to the local population, which was our aim, with perhaps some exceptions of Swansea and Flintshire and Wrexham, where they might be a little lower than what we might expect from the populations there. Um, I guess one of our great sadness is that despite lots of action over the whole period, there's still a big imbalance in the male and female referral um, rates. Um, with three quarters of the um, is the of the referrals being from men, and ninety nine percent of um, people were single, not married, uh, or not in a relationship. Um, and that, if you look at the age group um, in Wales, the equivalent is about ninety eight percent of um, of young men and women. So you know, it's to be expected. In terms of the age group of people, remember it was a sixteen to twenty five limit. Um, but we had within that we had a good spread um, with 20 to 21 year olds being the um, the largest group. Next slide. Um, when we look at um, diagnosis, uh, what what issues that people came to engage to change with? Well, certainly we were um, we were tasked with um, working with people with learning disabilities. Um, tasked with working with people who had autism or autistic spectrum conditions, and also people with specific learning difficulties. Now, um, you can see on the left there that we actually work with quite a good range. The project worked with a good range of people. Um, people with uh, only um, a main learning disability were the largest group, followed by people with ASC. But I think one of the features of the project is the, 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 the complexity of some people. So uh, we have there 127 people who had a learning disability and autism. Um, and we also had 130 people who just had a specific or combination of, of learning difficulties. Um, there was a big overlap with, with the whole range of specific learning difficulties with autism, learning, disability, um, and you know, also combinations of these um, for people that just came in with a specific learning um, uh, difficulty. And you can see them you know, on the right here, uh, the range, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, um, anxiety, depression. So people are complex. People are not just one thing or another. Um, and so it's important to recognise that at an individual level, people are sel seldom defined by one problem. Um, and it underlines, I think, the need for an individualised approach to trying to find out what works for people to get them into um, paid employment, rather than having a programme that says, we take these people or we take those people only. People are more than the sum of, um, of clearly just one definition of who they are. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that, um, that we found interesting was how many people have had occupational experiences previously. And you know, Tom gave us a good example of the different things that he'd done before he actually um, entered the job with Engage to Change. In fact, only 19% of young people reported that they'd had no previous work experience at all. Um, but we, we have no data really on the depth of those experiences or why those early experiences didn't actually lead to a job. 
Now, it could be that they were educational experiences and weren't designed to lead to a job, or they were later on and not well enough supported to turn them from an experience into a job. Um, we're, we're clearly looking at that. Um, but, you know, we did see a small amount of volunteering. That was um, uh, an outcome. Uh, for, sorry, but people had had volunteering in the past. Um, and nearly a third of people had had a job at some stage. So we're examining this as we go forward um, as a driving factor uh, for later outcomes. Certainly, we know from the US literature that um, work experience while you're at school um, is a predictor of employment after you leave school post um, 16 or 18 there. So I think there may well be some importance here about early transition experiences, you know, while at school um, for success in employment um, later on. Next slide, please. Going back to some of the, um, the statistics that Gerrit um, gave you earlier, early on, um, you can see there the number of um, people who went into paid placements, unpaid placements, paid jobs and those sustainment figures that this 13 week, well, 13 week figure is an interesting one i mean in the past many dw programs had that as at the point where they would give an additional payment for success so it's a bit of a rule of thumb about how successful a program is and um, as you can see it's quite a good sustainment rate um, for the project if people get jobs they tend to stay in them um I think it's a success story. I mean, uh, there are a lot of pay placements have been developed and they, they take time, very similar to you know, the time that you would take to set up a paid job. Um, the unpaid placements, quite often they were a, a short precursor to a paid placement um, of, of sometimes only a few days, but important nonetheless. Um, and on the right of that, of that first um, table, you can see our targets. So this at the year four point, we've exceeded some of the, well, the projects exceeded some of the targets in pay, pay placements, but with time to run, um, you know, it's hope, we hope that the project will meet all of its, uh, all of its recorded targets with the funders. Um, Again, as Gerrit suggested, we, we, we did run a number of internships, uh, originally three project search model um, uh, internships where people go into a placement for nine months with a large employer and do a number of placements. And also three um, uh, broad supported internship models originally, and those have been joined by additional projects so that we've now got eight as a total. And those are staggered. So some of them have been going on for five years and some at this point only one. Um, but you can see, you know, a decent number of internships started, a lot of um, work placements, quite commonly two or three per year, and a number of paid jobs. Now, if we look at the bottom there, we can see there are a number of different ways of looking at outcomes. If you look at just the employment rate, uh, the non-internship rate, 25% of people um, uh, up to this point had gone into paid work. In terms of uh, internship, 44% for project search. When you look at all of those um, supported, uh, all of those supported internships, 35%. And looking at those very important paid placements, the the trend, the um, that turned into a 40% employment rate. So if you take all that together, the employment rate from all engaged to short uh, change sources was about 30%. Now remember that compares particularly for people with learning disabilities to a national figure of probably about 5.1%. So it is a good result, although there's clearly room for, for further development as the figures for people with disability generally are probably 48% and something like 78% for the general population in terms of employment rates. So still a gap to close, but a good contribution to it nonetheless. Next slide, please. Um, again, you know, as, as Tom suggested, there are various pathways that you can follow through this project into work. We've identified a few here. Um, first, you know, a lot of people had an unpaid placement and then a paid placement, which didn't then tran uh, translate into, into work. You know, with a 40% trans translation rate for place paid placements, that means a 60% who didn't get a job. Um, and they're represented by the first two columns. But um, you can see that some people did an unpaid, a paid placement, and then a job. Some people went straight into a paid job. Some people had a paid placement and went to a job. Some just went into volunteering. And there are very few had an unpaid placement followed by a placed job. Um, so 
Um, I think it's important to know that there are different ways through this project that people can, um, can come into work and that direct entry was possible for some. You didn't have to go through any of the pay placements arrangements. Thank you, Simon. Um, if we look at the if the equality, I suppose you could call it, of employment outcomes, there um, th th these represent the percentages of all jobs that came from uh, that were for people with different conditions. So um, the largest proportion of jobs went to people with learning disabilities only, followed by people with autistic spectrum conditions, um, which I think is important. Um, it's clear to, sh to show that there, that there were differences in employment rates for people with different conditions. Um, and it's also important to show that people with multiple conditions like learning disability um, uh, and autism or autism and specific learning difficulties had, um, took a, a smaller share of the, of the, um, of the employment outcomes. Um, this is not necessarily... Uh, an issue of capacity of the person, but it's about the intensity and, um, and skill needed by supported employment to deliver outcomes for the most complex people. So it still represents a challenge, you know, to get the figures for more complex people up to levels we'd expect for uh, our main groups. Next slide, please. Um, if we look at the gender figures, as you recognise, there was a um, a disparity in, in our referrals, um, the people that we worked with between male and female. But if you look here at um, the, the percentages of men and women, males and females that went into um, unpaid placements, they were not significantly different, nor for paid placements. Um, where we did see a difference is a slight difference by year four in the number of women who uh, were less likely to go into employment with men. And this remains an issue that the project and projects like it need to address. You know, why is it that we get fewer women into the project? And why is it that the outcomes are not quite as successful as for their male colleagues? Next slide, please. Um, as we said, the employment offers a time. Job coaching is really important for, um, for, is really key to the success of employment for these individuals. Um, remember we, those different pathways that we showed you later on. Well, there are three here and you can see the differences uh, in the average amount of time and therefore the profile of job coach input uh, given those different pathways. So at the top, the blue one is uh, for somebody who went into a paid or for people who went into a paid placement and then a paid job. The red in the middle, those people who had an unpaid placement, a paid placement and then a paid job. And at the bottom, those who went directly into a paid job without any precursors. Um, you can see, you know, first of all, that um, different pathways have different job coach implications, not least in terms of the amount of time that it takes to do it. Um, you can see that particularly from the, the blue line that additional help can be needed as placements turn into a job. You can see where on average the, um, the, um, the job, uh, sorry, the work placement turned into a job here. And then along the bottom are quarters of, of uh, time engaged. Um, it's also clear that young people entering directly into a job had a, a lower input of job coaching. And nearly half of those had previous employment uh, experience. And that takes me back to that point about you know, hoping to understand a bit more about the, the role of, um, of uh, what kind of work um, people might have done um, post the uh, Engage to Change project that makes it an easier move into employment, critically with this job coach help. Okay, um, I'm going to pass you back to Geraint now because we're going to play a video and then I'll come back to you and finish off with a bit more about, um, about this and, uh, and some of the situation post-pandemic. Thank you, Geraint. Joking about Thank you, Steve. Um, as Steve mentioned, um, for presenting the first part of your findings, we're now going to have a short video break um, with a video from one of our participants, Molly Matthews. Molly took part in an internship with Engage Change and she also worked closely with the National Centre of Mental Health to create a presentation on neurodiversity. So I believe Sam will be showing the video now of Molly with the training of neurodiversity. Jock and Molly. I'm 21 and I'm from Cardiff. 
but they like going out like with friends, um, going shopping, looking after my nieces. I wasn't really doing, I don't think I was doing anything because I left school and then went straight from school to engage to change. So I was like, Well, that I was getting kind of bored of just being like sat in like kind of the house. Um, I was finding it difficult as well to try and learn, to try and understand in myself what I wanted to do. Um, and also like I had no, I, I had no understanding of how to do like a CV. Um, knowing what was the appropriate like clothing and stuff like that that we had to have if we had interviews and things like that. Um. The Hayden Airs building. Um, so I was looking at like consent forms for um, checking if they'd all been like ticked and add the right, like correct information um, and then putting them on a spreadsheet and then picking up like a little pack um of like because obviously they also done like the needles and taking blood samples and all that so I was making it them types of packs it was mainly that obviously we seen like just knowing that like obviously how low present like the percentage and that was of people that had neurodiversity um and just being able to like kind of tell me like share our own experience and feel that like how but like feeling that we never had to explain ourselves because of who we were and that being able to be like yeah i'm neurodiversity but what like I can still do what you can do. There's no need to push me aside and be like, oh yeah, like you're like you're kind of dumb or whatever because of neurodiversity. It was like I don't know if the rest of the people who done that thing as well felt it, but for me, it felt like that I was able to say about my like about my learning disabilities and that because I knew that I wasn't going to get bullied by them for, because I because we all had a bit of neurodiversity in us. I I hate it when people don't even get to know somebody, they just assume autism, learning difficulty. And I'm like, have you even spoken to that person? Mm -hmm. Have you seen how their day-to-day -day life goes any person is a is a human being and and until you've spoken to that person or actually seen what they like don't be judging people because that's where stereotyping does come up and it and it's horrible because every day i try and not stereotype somebody but i get stereo i get stereotyped Just like emailing the, um, I think it was people from like internally and externally, like around Cardiff University, and um, to like see if they wanted to uh, like watch the unit, like new like new diversity and things like that. And then whenever we did have the meetings, like presenting it to them, like so say thank you for coming to the meeting, um, and just. I, I, telling them that obviously if there's anything that they needed to know um that they could have like contacted any of them on the contact page or contacted me it was like nearly over 200 people and that was just like different and diff with different companies it was mainly obviously just like letting them watch the video because obviously we've done it by video so like letting them watch the video and then just answer any questions that they had
judge them until you've known until you until you get to know them. Like like yes, okay, they may have that or like a bit of autism or whatever. But you never know. They could still have a little bit of autism, but get that work done. Get all the deadlines. Get anything done. Never ever and it's like going back to that saying, never judge a book by its cover. I know we're not books, but it's the same as never judge that person by the cover of them. That was one of our participants, Molly's um, video there. Um, thank you, Molly, for sharing your um, experiences with us and the work you've done to raise awareness of neurodiversity. Okay, I will now hand you back now over to Steve um, for his final part for, of his presentation on the project's reports findings. Back to you, Steve. Yeah. Thanks very much, Gary. Right, thanks to Molly. Um, she did a sterling job when she worked with us in uh, in the university and um, you know, going from strength to strength, strength to strength, I think. Um, I want you to, you know, a number of us you know, in this event are interested in um, the development of skills for learners. Um, and we did, hello, gone dark. Um, we tracked the skills gain um, on a number of skills that were relevant to employers over time, um, all the way through, you know, from when people first came in through to getting a paid job. Um, the diagram here, if you look to the left, there's a scale that job coaches um, uh, rated people on from one, which was having no competency in a particular area through to five, which meant they had full competency in that area. Um, three, you know, if you were over three, it meant that you had a, you know, a valuable contribution, I think, to make to the employer. Um, here, there's only three out of a whole number of, um, of skill areas to, to just give you an example of this and to describe it. So you can see that in these areas, on average, people, uh, you saw skill development over time. Um, in some areas, um, particularly in communication and working without support, you see it cross that, that, that uh, competency boundary um, to from lack of competence to positive skill. There's also some, some development on, on average um, as people go into the job from a paid placement, perhaps, to a paid job. Um, so we think, we believe that supported employment and this way of working is a mechanism for developing vocational skills in the workplace um, quite effectively. Um, but, you know, as you can see, see there, on average, there's, there remains a gap to full competency for, for some areas. It's important to remember that for some individuals, they, of course, got to full competency in a particular job and a particular set of skills. But um, you know, we, we have to recognise that um, the support we give people in the workplace is really important to the skills that they can then demonstrate in real life rather than you know, in surrogate measures of their skill uh, that might be exams or, or um a s a s simulated examples of what they can do. So this is about developing skill in real world environments. And uh, we believe there's some good evidence that it, it, it works and is effective. Um, of course, we're all interested in employer reactions um, and they're largely positive about the people they place or employ. If you look over to the left hand side, here's a number of areas that are important to employers that they were asked to rate their placed people or employed people um, against. And there are positive scores um, for employers on most of these areas, um, which I think is really important. Um, I think crucially, 92% of the employers said they would employ a person with similar disabilities, but to underline, if a supported agency was involved. So that and other qualitative information we have suggests that the, that the, the contribution of job coaching and supported employment to the employer itself to be able to cater for these individuals to uh, increase their diversity is really important. Um, it's not just a matter of awareness being changed. It's also a service that helps them to practically cope with a new individual coming into their agency. Um, we highlight here quality of work and initiative as elements of people's performance that were positive that, but had lower ratings. Um, you would think quantity of work would be a real problem if it was, if it was lower than, than some of the other satisfaction ratings. But um, 
you know, one of the things we find from talking to employers is that productivity in work is not everything and that they see people making a rounded contribution to the workplace that involves all sorts, sorts of other things about motivating other team members and creating an environment for, for good work. Um, taking initiative is, of course, a complex skill, um, but we do need to develop, I think, m- more strategies for improving these more complex um, aspects of work behaviour. And things like um, you know, self-instructional strategies where we might be able to help people to help shape their behaviour to something that's, that's uh, more appreciated in the workplace are all things that we need to examine in the future, I think. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to move on to the challenges the project faced at the end of year four. Um, remember, I think we, we started getting into real trouble in March 2020, and this report ends in June 2020. Um, and that, um, we, I guess we still continue to face some of the, um, the waves from um, that uh, initial period of, um, of, of COVID-19 and the lockdowns that came with it. What you're looking at here is um, a graph of paid placements, which are in blue, and also paid jobs. And you can see when we get to around March, April 2020, they took a nosedive. Um, and you know the project started to become or, be, or move to helping people who are in work or about to be placed to, to cope with the um, uh the ramifications of the lockdowns, uh, the Welsh lockdowns being shown by date below. Um, and, you know, what we saw was lots of people furloughed from their jobs. You know, Tom's experience again was a classic, um, but for others deferred or closed placements or even, you know, a failure to pick up jobs that were just about to start. Can we have the next slide, please? So we know from other Welsh government reports that um, disabled people, disabled workers were um, disproportionately hit by um, by closures um, during the pandemic uh, and post pandemic. Um, but for people with learning disabilities and autism on that project, on this project, we saw that some people had to leave work because they were identified as um, needing to be to shield they had some had family members that needed to shield some were fearful of um, getting covid for very good reasons and um, at that stage refused to continue work remember we had in some conditions lack of ppe um, for people and we were all scrabbling around to try and find what a mask looked like um some people because of their disability had difficulty understanding new COVID rules that were rapidly being brought in. At least we forget, you know, a lot of people working in rural areas, there was a reduction in public transport or you know, temporary closures. Um, employers needed support to furlough disabled workers. They themselves were struggling to see how do we furlough people? Can we furlough people who have a disability who are working with us? Um, and also returning to welfare benefit um, for some and then getting people back into uh, work for others was also something that needed support. It's a bit mashed at the bottom, but but there's also at the bottom the the, um, the fact that people are on the brink of welfare benefit. Some people have come out of welfare benefit or were receiving money from access to work from DWP to help support their placements. And all of those had to be um, rewound put on hold for some people who were furloughed, uh, welfare benefits reclaimed so that people could um, could live without a wage if they weren't being furloughed. And all of that um, meant that those people in our project, this project, um, with engagement for support and employment, um, became a significant factor in them moving successfully from and later on back to employment. So the whole project geared up into trying to help people to cope with this um, unprecedented challenge. Next slide, please. Um, so as an overview, this probably goes back to our figures in October, November this year, uh, uh, sorry, last year. Um, we're updating these figures now for, for, for year five and the closure of furlough. But um, what we found was clearly 
pay placements were suspended or postponed. Um, we had 26, you know, uh, jobs that we looked at that were furloughed. This is um, percentage of jobs furloughed, and we had um, 29 percent of uh, jobs were furloughed in Wales as a whole. So actually, there were less um, jobs furloughed here within this cohort of engaged to change than, than outside. Four percent became uh, began working from home. Six percent were made redundant. But 60%, 67% of those furloughed returned to work by about October last year. So to us, it seems that the evidence shows some protective effect for jobs from supported employment being available in a crisis. And I think that's important as we're now facing constant economic shocks from one, you know, we're still working through the, the, the effects of Brexit. We've had this, which is still working its way out. And now we've got you know, different additional shots coming through from energy pricing, the war in Ukraine, and it never seems to end. But some supported employment is a very seems to be a very good um, prop to people with learning disabilities and autism in jobs um, during these particular periods. Next slide, please. So if I conclude, um, I think we're happy to say that job coaching is key uh, to delivering employment outcomes for, our, for people with um, intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities and autism. Um, if you look at the basic rates of 25% for engaged to change and broadly 35% across its supported internships, um, they're well above those that you see in the general population of people with those conditions. Employers seem to recognise that task performance is not the only way people can contribute. Um, successfully to their businesses and there are many other ways that people as well as being competent to a certain level can contribute to um, to them through productivity in the team generally um, workforce cohesion and also crucially diversifying the workforce um, employers do recognize the importance of job coaches to their their and the person's employment success um, initially but also in the long term um, to help them with you know, transitional events like crises or even when there's a change in the way that a, a firm operates. Um, one of the difficulties of the project that we have found was the existing the existence of waiting lists in some areas. So not everyone got a, a service immediately. Some waited quite a long time for it. Um, young people were engaged, but some time was lost before offering a placement and we lost some people along the way from that. But um, we have, the project has developed options to keep individuals engaged, like job clubs, while they're waiting for a placement, um, to try and keep them and, crucially, family engaged with the operation. And it's clear that we need to invest and deliver intensively early on to make sure young people and their family understand that they can work with appropriate and professional support. Last slide, please. Um, I think looking ahead, I think the experience of Engage to Change suggests that the employment aspirations that are inherent in the Wellbeing Act, the Future Generations Act, and you know, in the last few weeks, the employability plan will not reach people with learning disabilities and those with autistic spectrum conditions without support and employment and job coaching being a part of a system um, delivered for them in Wales. As Angela said earlier, we, we have made some suggestions about this, but there are a number of logical pathways that require easy access to job coaching. Um, we've heard about supporting apprenticeships and traineeships, which are actually using, you know, using in pilots or, or rollouts job coaching in supported internships that are being delivered um, via colleges through the new independent living curriculum, pathway four. We also crucially need a direct route into employment for adults over 25. We never dealt with people over 25 in this project. And there's still a crying need out there for those adults um, up to pensionable age to find a way back into work. And we also need job coaching to facilitate access to relevant employability programmes that Welsh Government are putting forward. And there's a whole plethora in the um, employment plan, uh, which, will, you know, which can be accessed perhaps by people with mild um, uh, learning and other disabilities if they have the support of a job coach. So we've argued for a national job coaching service to make all of that available um, when these different schemes and people need them. And we've argued for a greater commitment to delivering jobs for people 
from the NHS in particular and the public sector in Wales. Now, this isn't an idle request because we know there's a learning disability employment pledge in, um, in England, which has led to a lot of um, certainly support internships and a lot of jobs being found for these uh, people in, in our target groups in England. Um, so we know it can work, but it hasn't yet work, uh, operated in, in, in Wales. And then finally, I think we regard, we regard better integration between Welsh government funding and things like DWP access to work funding to be essential to progress in Wales. And that may well be, you know, changing the way that access to work and uh, other grants like that operate so that they can work in better in a Welsh context and alongside the kind of employability monies that Welsh government are putting into it. So um, I think I'll finish there and hand you back to Geraint. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Steve, for um, telling us a very detailed um, report. Um, that's really helpful. Much appreciated, as always. Thank you um, very much once again. OK. Um, OK, so next now, I'm very pleased um, to introduce a video um, of one of the project's fantastic apprentices, um, Fionn Parsons. She's come on leaps and bounds, and this video will tell you why. In this video, we will also see Fionn's experience as a supported apprenticeship apprentice on the Engage to Change programme. Dioch. My name is Fionn Anna Parsons. I'm 24 years old and I live near Carmarthen with my mum, stepdad and my dog Gryffindor. My hobbies and interests are, I like to go for a walk with my dog. Um, I like to go to a sporting event with my family. Um, I like reading books. Well, I was out of education and I felt like that I needed some support in getting into employment. Board has indicate, had indicated um, that they would keep me on, but unfortunately the pandemic hit, I had a chance to finish it, uh, it has already ended. Teams call with Kaylee, uh, my advisor, and um, we had a look through what job would suited me well, and she found this one with Cerebra and as a library assistant and um, we all thought that this one would suit me um, and of course along with it I got to do apprenticeship and I thought this was well suited for me. Um, I was meeting up with Tracy, my uh, job coach and she came, as, came with me as a support um, into the interview and um, we both sat down with the my manager, line manager Janet Pugh. She is lovely, by the way, and obviously Beverly Hitchcock. Like formal slash informal kind of interview. Um, just having a, it was just mainly chat on. It was mainly just like a chat, really. Well. Cerebra is a charity for ch children with neurological conditions. I'm under the library department as a library assistant. Oh, I do um, a bit of admin work, um, computer work. Uh, I'm also tend to clean up toys, um, send books out. It makes me feel like a better person, especially if I've got Asperger's myself and they can understand me, that, you know, because it's a charity but with neurological conditions. So, yeah, it's really, I just love it so much. He came in on, like um, once a, one, one day a week uh, with me. Uh, 
and just basically just get me settled in, settled in really. And then um, then she gradually um, steps back, if that makes sense. Just like um, just settle, get myself in, like tidy up my desk, and then sometimes I'll do that myself. Um, yeah, having Tracy there, she was just amazing. Uh, yeah, I've, they've been really amazing regarding support wise. She keeps in regular contact and um, just checking how I'm doing, and I can be honest with her as well, and, um, and it's been great. What I've heard from Kaylee. Uh, my mentor Zoe and my manager Janet has been incredible, absolutely incredible. If if it wasn't for Kaylee, I wouldn't have found this job and I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much as I thought I would. Um, but realistically, oh, the support of is incredible. And, you know, I just cannot thank them enough. They've been absolutely brilliant and, you know, they understand me for me and not judgmental, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I got, well, I got my confidence. I get to work in a team. Well, hopes, I hope, fingers crossed, I hope to stay with Cerebra probably long term because I can really see it happening. You know, if I enjoy being there and I get on with everyone, what well, I think, it, you know, it just makes things easier for me. I feel like I'm a different person. <laughs> I can be a bit more independent, um, you know, saving up for my own house um, and save up for the wedding and things like that. Uh, and when I'm in, you know, every time I come home, I'm I'm literally always home in good mood. The Cerebra has been, as well as the apprenticeship together, you know, I, if I, I'm like a completely different person, like really, really, really happy person now and I feel like I'm looking after myself better in work. Well, I wouldn't hesitate I wouldn't hesitate to do it go for it you will benefit from it especially you get a lot of support from I would I would not hesitate but go for it no definitely this one definitely this one as a library assistant one I love it so much and two I get on with everyone else and it's just been an absolute it's been an absolute pleasure to be part of the, of a charity with neurological conditions where I got that myself you know it's worked out great I think it's something about me that stood out to them, I think. But I'm not sure what it is. Not that I'm going to pinpoint what it is, but yeah, there's something special about me, so. And I know I'm special because I've been told I'm special, so. You know, uh, you know, all, all my life I've been accepting the negativity and not accepting the positivity of both stuff. But now it's the complete opposite. Now, <laughs> great job, great life. <laughs> Beyond Parsons there with um, her story on being a supported apprentice. I absolutely love that video, but the best bit is when um, Fionn gets asked, what would you say to someone um, if they thought about doing a pendant? And she just went, we'll go for it. Just do it. I thought that's the most brilliant attitude to have. Thank you, Fionn. Um, okay, it is now time for our Q&A. Um, we've got about maybe 15, 20 minutes of the Q&A, so not too bad time-wise. Um, for the question answer panel today, we have representatives from the project's partners, including our speakers that we already have heard from this morning, Dr. Stephen Baker, Thomas Oakes, and Fionn Parsons will be here to answer any questions you may have. We already have a question. Um, this is from Dan 
can I'm multitasking you again? I'm going to multitasking at my age. Um, right, this has come from Dalton Holtam, and his question is um, uh, uh, he asked, is going to see people with learning disability being identified as a priority group in the new Welsh Government plan for employability and skills? and the commitment to taking forward activity to improve access to and outcomes on our employability programmes for people with significant learning disabilities by providing specialist intensive job code support. Do you think this should also be extended to people with autism? Um, can I, Steve, can I come to you first on this one, if I may? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a good question. Um, should it be, in the current context, should it be extended to people with uh, autism? Yeah, I think certainly because as a as a group they can really benefit from this this sort of support um in general should it be you know a needs-based rather than a condition-based service i think also the answer to that is probably yes it should be i mean certainly um when you look at the wider literature on job coaching and support and employment you see improved employment rates through this mechanism for um people with sensory loss i mean there's some projects working on that in wales at the moment the job sense project um people with cerebral palsy um people with physical disabilities people with brain injury um also um under its other uh, you know the, its other name which is um oh um anyway um, people with mental health problems where it's a, a major con contributing factor the problem is that once you set up a generic route and a generic service you find that the the smaller and more marginal groups do lose out in the you know the more you have a generic um, a generic job coaching service for everybody their experience tends to be uh, more with the higher volume groups and their skill base that you need to work intensively with people with learning disability or with um, uh, autism goes down. So at the moment, until we've got a real foothold and a real good service for these people, I would keep it, keep it specific, but certainly the potential is there for it to move out into a lot of other areas. Thank you, Steve. I'm just caught up at the time. Um, Heff and David, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really sorry. I had to just leap out then because I've got a gas leak on, in the house and the gas guy just turned up just as I was about to ask, uh, ask a question. I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm here primarily today uh, as a parent. Uh, you know, my main job, really, as a parent of a child with autism, um, she's six years old and she um, struggles terribly with communication, speech and language and communication. Um, and I'm interested in her future, obviously, and, and the kind of things that you're doing to lay the groundwork for her uh, as she goes into her teens and adulthood. But particularly um, as a Senate member, uh, for Caerphilly, I visited one of the uh, placements with Engage to Change, a, a young man called Ian, who was placed in the spa in True Thomas. And I think Stephen and I have had conversations as well. Um, and I'm, I mean, what I'd be really interested to do is to meet with um, people in my constituency who've benefited from the project. So if there's an opportunity both to catch up with what Ian's been doing and meet with people in my constituency, I'd welcome that opportunity. And the other question I've got is, I, I hope I'm not being really stupid here, but I, I'm trying to understand the future of the project as, as much as the, the, the you know the, the the plans the Welsh government have uh, to support the, what was being learned so far. So where is the project going next, um, and how is that imbalance between men and women also going to be addressed? I, I hope that's that's clear. Okay, so just clarify the two questions then, um, Heaven David. The one question is on your constituency in Caerphilly. Um, to say, you know, maybe our young people can probably um, link in with that. And the second yeah, I'd, question... I'd do some visits myself to, to see what's going on. Brilliant. OK. Well, if you want, then, because we're talking about young people, um, Fiona or Tom, do you want to come in on that point? Because we're talking about young, young people. You are on mute, Fionn. It's easily done. Let's see. You're back. OK. So um, we've got two questions. And, um, so the other question, Hef and David, as well, was, um, oh, sorry, my head's going because I'm, I'm getting on a bit. So first question on the constituency in, in Caerphilly um, and seeing if there's pot potential visits. And the second question was, how are the project's going to move forward? 
Well, I'm going to move on. Okay, let's go to the forward of the project bit. Angela, have you got any comments on that with um, moving on for the project coming from the project management um, perspective? Hi, thanks, Geraint. Um, the project is due to finish at the end of November this year. Um, and the work I was talking about that we've been doing with Welsh Government is very much because the intention has always been to leave a legacy. Um, and, you know, the job coach support is mentioned in the new employability and skills plan. We know it's going to be available through the Jobs Growth Wales Plus programme and also through the shared apprenticeships. And of course, we've got the supported internships that are expanding now as well. Um, but the, the kind of whole thing of the project was to leave this legacy. We're, we're not leaving that piece of work there. We're going to continue on with that piece of work until the project is finished. Um, and our partner organisations, Elite and Agoriad. So the way that the project works, that Wales is basically split in half and Elite deliver for the south of Wales and Agoriad from the north of Wales. Um, they're going to continue working and continue working with the Welsh Government on this. And Andrea, I don't know if you want to say any more on that. Um, because also uh, Elite cover the Caffili area, so it would be Elite that you'd need to... Um, converse with about visiting the young people in Caffili. Can I yes, hand over just to you, Andrew? Put in the chat that, yeah, that'd be very welcome. Yeah, so I've just noted into the chat that we could arrange those for you, Heaven, um, whether it's to speak to people individually or, or as a group. Um, so, you know, you can leave that to us and we'd be A's with you. Um, with regards to the longer term aims of the project, it was always going to be a legacy project for us. And so, you know, there's a lot of work going on at the moment, as Angela and, and Steve have mentioned about the supported apprenticeships. We've got plans for that for August 22 onwards. Uh, we're looking at ways to continue supported internships as well with the Collegae Cymru group. Um, and we're also looking at Job Growth Wales Plus of working on the supported trainee, well, what were supported traineeships there, um, so to move that forward with job coaching. We've also made some recommendations as well to colleagues in the employment division within Welsh Government of how we could perhaps sustain the work that we do through further links with the Access to Work team and uh, enabling job coaches to be funded that way, bringing money into Wales rather than, you know, Welsh Government having to pay for all of this as well. So it's, whilst the project will end in November 22, for the supported employment organisations involved, it will be about uh, enabling this to be sustainable and carry it forward as well. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Stephen, I know you're going to make a dash at half 11, so that's fine. Um, but got a question that's come, well, it's been asked from Duncan um, and of Heffin as well. Um, so I think um, we're going to answer this. They're asking, what do you think there is a gender imbalance about the project that you already highlighted in your presentation, do you think? Um. Yeah, it's a it, it's a complex one, and, it, and it's one that's been regularly discussed within the consortium of Engage the Change. And there have been, you know, workshops to try and stimulate more referrals. There have been, you know, lots of initiatives I think to do it, and it's remained fairly um, stuck. Um, I, I think um, the the project does target people with autism, which would lead you know to there being more men in the project anyway, um, or also through you know a lack of a poor diagnosis of women i think with autism and and, and as, uh, asc and as, uh, asperger's but um when when you take that into account there's still an imbalance um, irrespective of you know targeting that group um it's too great now there have been a lot of arguments in the literature about this you know what we've seen all the way through my career a kind of a you know a two-thirds one-third split in male and female all the way through all the projects so it's it's fairly pervasive not just this project um some people talk about um cultural or family expectations of a job for for their for their daughters um uh, some uh, have also highlighted that um there's more of a fear of bullying and exploitation among young women going into the workplace by you know families and also others um also, you know, others have mentioned a poor match sometimes between um, employment specialists and, you know, their clients who are women. If you don't get that right, it, it, it needs to be managed, you know, more sensitively sometimes to encourage people into work. Sometimes you don't get the right match. Maybe we don't concentrate on that enough. Um, 
and you know, maybe some lower expectations among employers also of, of women with disabilities rather than men with, with disabilities. And, and actually, in this project, we cannot put our finger on on, on which of those, if any, it, it would be. But um, some of them are bigger than this project, and, and they're more about our, I think, our more general expectations of men versus women with these conditions. And um, you know, there's a lot more work needed to do it. I mean, as an aside, there's, there's also an issue of bringing, you know, BAME um, people in, in, into projects like this, which, you know, again, is, is more difficult than it should be. Thank you, Steve. Um, just one more question for you. This is coming from Sarah Frost. Um, the final comment, um, better integration between Welsh Government and DWP access to work funding has are essential. Are conversations taking place or plan to explore this further? Um, and then if something does not suit the chief of our contact details. So it's basically asking um, the final common integration between Welsh Government and DWP access to work yeah. funding are essential and are conversations taking place? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm going to defer that to, to um, Andrea Wayman. She's okay. been doing some work on this. Okay, apologies, sorry, Andrea. I also want to say thank you, Steve, on that one. But um, the question came from Sarah Frost at DWP. And my understanding is that there are conversations occurring between DWP um, and uh, Welsh Government Employment um, senior civil servants regarding that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. Um, we've got five minutes. Are there any questions for Fiona and Thomas, our young people, um, asking from the floor? Anything on the experiences or um, heaven? Yeah. Yeah, to, to both Fiona and Thomas, really. You know, what, what are your future plans? What's happening next? Well, my future plans are hoping to stay with Cerebra as we are charity for children and parents with neurological conditions. Um, I love my job so much as a library assistant. And of, of course, I've, I'm currently undergoing apprenticeship. As currently with apprenticeship, there's been a bit of a faff going around. But having said that, it's a no brainer to go for it. So I'm just, hoping in long term now I get I stay with Cerebra in long term hopefully yes um I'm probably hoping to stay in long term with Weatherspoons like uh in in hoping to increase my hours but um you know it, the Engage to Change project again as I said was amazing they've really helped me you know to to find the work that I needed and I just want to say thank you very much it's it's been amazing thank you and I really do hope that they continue with this uh with this project and the job coaching you know because it's really helped me and I think it should help others as well so it's been fantastic thank you can I also can I add as well sorry Go on. Go on, um uh, sorry, <laughs> um, as well, um, with Engage to Change and the job coaching, it's been absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It's worked out great for me. So I wouldn't be here had it not had it not come to Engage to Change. As well, now I'm celebrating my one year anniversary in May. So, yes, that's how exciting this job is. And I'm loving it every day. And I get on with everyone else here. That's brilliant. Thank Can you. I say, Gary? Go on, Evan. Yeah, go on, yeah. yeah. This, this session has given me some very good ideas of what I want to ask Welsh Government Ministers, um, particularly what Fiona and uh, Thomas just said. I think I've got a list of questions I'm going to be raising in the Senate now um, about the future. Thank you both. Oh, not a problem. Any, oh, you're any, welcome. Any, any further questions, just uh, drop me a... Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you for the input, Fionn and Thomas and Heaven. Thanks for um, your questions. Thank you for contributing to Welsh Government as well. Um, that's really much yeah, um, appreciated. Um, that there's definitely a platform there that we can work through. That's fantastic. OK, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, so I, first of all, I would like to thank our panel, um, Fionn and Thomas, for their contributions. Thank our you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr Stephen Bayer. 
talking about the report. Um, with thanks to Angela Kenvin for her opening remarks as project manager, much appreciated. And also special thanks as well to um, Fionn and Molly for their in, um, inspiring videos oh, as well. If you have missed anyone out, I sincerely apologize. <laughs> We'd also like to big, uh, send a big thank you to you as well and um, for you all for attending on behalf of all the project partners and the participants this morning. And um, we do hope that you found it interesting and the resources useful. The full report is now available via our website, which I believe Sophie just posted a link in the chat. Um, the link is available in both Welsh, English and EasyRead. We will also send this out to you later on this afternoon. If you have any further questions or comments, then please feel free to get to get in touch. And on, like I mentioned, on behalf of the project partners and myself and young people, we thank you for your time. Hello, Dioch and do take care.